Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. So, the December update is out, there's a lot going on, so we're gonna do our usual roundup of the patch notes. I'm gonna go through and show you a few of the new things in game, and I wanna try and do this as fast as possible, because I, I wanna get back in the game and do the Christmas events. For those of you that don't know, I'll have a video on that. Probably after this one, there's a Christmas event on right now. Go farm mobs that are level 50 or over, because <laughs> the drops are insane. So just get on there. Anyway, let's get into the patch notes. All right, here we are with the December update patch notes. So the first update is there's a new set of Chronicles quests which revolve around Rangora and Morpheus, I believe. These can be unlocked by, of course, pressing Shift L. You pay a few gil, there's a little bit of gold, and you can unlock them. Now, there's two different ones. There are ones for the Noyans and ones for the Haranians, and you can unlock both of these regardless of your faction. But only the Noyans can do the Noyan side of the quest line, and only the Haranians can do the Haranian side of the quest line. The pirates, uh, no luck. You just you don't get to do either. Apparently, apparently that's just a thing. So there you go. And then we get to Morpheus, the Death Trigger, and Rangora, the Oathbound. These are basically the next version of these world bosses. So after after Morpheus reaches 80% health or lower, he'll transform, and Rangora has a chance to spawn again as Rangora the outward after Captain Rangora is beaten, so there's achievements for that, and I assume you get some new drops as well, so that's what there is there. And then we have the Rank 2 Aurora Boss Awakening Scrolls, which is the ones for the Morpheus and the Rangora, which you can craft at a Proven Warrior Workbench, but you will need to, you know, have some Honor Forge Medals and whatever Morpheus, the Death Trigger, and Rangora the Oathbound actually drop as well to make them happen. But that allows you to upgrade the Burning Oath and Frozen Anguish. So that's cool. That's in there now. All right, and revamped Stillwater Gulf is here finally. Stillwater Gulf, I... Never really got to play around with a bunch. I tried it a few times, so I don't even remember what they've really... Ch I don't even remember what it's like, and I don't see what they've really changed. But essentially, this was a battle royale where you were all on combat clippers, and you'd go around and just shoot each other and collect supplies and stuff to upgrade your ship. So, I'm not seeing too much here that's changed. There's something about various natural disasters that can err all over the map, like poison clouds and twisters. I feel like I remember twisters... I don't really remember the other things, so I don't know. In, I don't know what's too different here, but I might do a video on this as well, looking into the revamped version of it in a bit more detail. But that's cool. Now you'll get some curious badges and naval commendations if you actually come first. Which and these naval commendations can be used on the Stillwater Combat Clipper, which is a 30-day scroll, so it's temporary. It's a temporary combat clipper. It's slightly better than the normal one, but the uh, components can't be changed, and it also doesn't deal or take any collision damage, which is interesting. So there you go. Then we have the Rampage series vehicle customization, which is very exciting for me because I use the Rampage Chroma. So they can now be converted to the Rampage GT, and you can't revert it after this, so you need to be careful of that if you want to, you know, keep hold of one of them. But this lets you mess around with the car a bit more. You can actually remove some of the back seats of your vehicle and change them out for stuff and throw in a supercharger and rampage nitros. You can play different music on it and have a piano on there. I don't know. There's a lot of weird stuff like that. So I'm looking forward to messing around with this and seeing what it's like. Also, the Redwood Roadster, Nova, Nova Speedster, and Apex Drift all get an extra trade pack slot, which you can now craft. It does cost quite a bit to make, but you can throw that on there. The only issue with that is it'll add a bit of weight to the car, so you won't go as fast. But, you know, it's another trade pack slot. That's cool. Good stuff. All right, uh, now we have machine anchoring, charms, and shards. So these shards can be crafted into charms and emblems, which these are all just going to make it so you can, you know, have a better chance of not destroying your machine parts, which is cool. So that's a new addition we've got. All right, uh, now we have more changes to Miss Rain Gorge. This only just came out, but now they've added a faction competition to it, very similar to the one you have in Reedwind. So... Whoever wins this then has the chance to take on the Rosapoda and then has the chance to take on Nyla after that. But everyone else from all the other factions, if they don't 
come first in the faction competition, they're kicked out of the zone and they can't do anything there. Which is interesting. But yeah, after Nyla, if you don't defeat Nyla after the hour, the faction competition will start again and then another faction will get a chance at it. So, yeah. Now, the way that you can get these points around the gorge is just killing random mobs. There's also a daily quest. You can also summon the Recipoda. And this has to be done by a hero fa a faction hero, and this can only be done once every 36 hours, but that'll give you a bunch more points as well. And the points you actually get for defeating the Recipoda is 1,500 if the faction competition is active. They've also reduced the health on the Recipoda and changed the path that it goes a little bit as well. So they've made quite a few changes to this, which is going to be interesting to see. I've still yet to actually be able to have a go at Recipoda or Nyla, so... I never even got to see the original one, but yeah, looking forward to giving this a go. All right, and then we have two new mythic bosses in the gorge. These go along the exact same path as the Recipoda, or a similar path, it says, uh, with the Athenium Golem and the Guardian Doomgaze. The Athenium Golem floats a little lower to the ground, so everyone can attack it, and the Doomgaze is higher up in the air, so you have to hit it with ranged abilities or siege weapons if you're a melee, I suppose. But when you kill these, they leave behind two Misrain Heridium Veins, which give you a Heridium Pack, which you can turn in for 20 points each, I assume. I don't know where you turn these in. Doesn't make that 100% clear, but that's interesting. All right, and now we've got some Siege Improvements as well. It mentions something about all Siege Weapons being provided by the King slash Queen. I'm not exactly sure what it means by that. But yeah, you can summon your customized vehicles during a siege. If a faction has less territory, you actually get more siege weapons to compensate for that. And if you have the siege Recipota mounts, which I didn't know was a thing, you can use that during that as well. But there can only be one siege Recipota used per faction. The siege commander can't can have any siege weapon with the exception of the Recipota according to this. And then also like the health and of the defensive Archeum, Lodestone, Castle Walls, and Siege Tank, Shotgun, Steam Tank have all been increased, so there we go. Alright, and then we have the new weapon, Misogon's Breath, which sounds like it's a flamethrower. You can inflict ignition and burn targets, which decreases the defense, magic defense, and healing received. But there's also a shock bomb, so maybe it's not a flamethrower, which can be fired at airborne targets, or targets on the castle wall. Airborne targets fall, and cannoneers are knocked back and can't use the cannon for a short while. And when the play player carrying the breath dies, the weapon explodes and deals a significant amount of siege damage to all enemies within 8 meters. It also grants 20 stacks of ignition, which deals damage over time to enemies afflicted, which is cool. I don't really do sieges, which, but I'd like to actually try this out. We'll see. We'll see if that happens. All right, and then we have the Commendation Collector, which is a new NPC in Marianopol and Ostera. And apparently you use 10 labor to submit a faction commendation, which is earned through various tasks, and it gives you 300 honor points for doing so. And after collecting a thousand of these, the NPC will then give two options to the faction, which the heroes get to choose, which is either you get a higher level blessing for your statue, or a siege boost, which can be used, which helps with sieges, I guess. And then based on the choice, they'll fulfill the request. You'll still be able to turn in faction combinations for honor, but they won't be present for the heroes until it resets after seven days. So that's interesting. Now the enhanced statue buff, you need to actually have the basic statue buff first, and then you have to talk to the critic, which costs 100 labor, which you'll then enhance it and give it the following effects, which is loot drop rate 5%, increase the amount of honor points gained during war or from quests by 15%, and increases vocation badge gain by 15%, which is cool, and that lasts for 24 hours. And then we have the siege boost, which can be used if the faction has one territory or fewer. So if you're on the attacking side and you own no territory, then you get 10% attack and magic attack. Your siege damage from vehicles gets plus 25%. Toughness plus 720, and received siege damage minus 
And if the attacking side holds one territory, you actually get a rank 2 version of this, which increases your attack and magic attack by 20%, siege damage by 50%, toughness is still 720%, but the received siege damage is minus 30% as well, which is very cool. If used when defending, you get the Siege Valor boost rank 1. It appears you can only get 1 if you're defending, and it will give you an attack and magic attack boost of 10%. Siege damage from vehicles plus 25%, and then it decreases the duration of all CC by 8%. And it can also the siege boost can also be used by both factions during the same siege as long as the requirements met. I don't know how that would get met. I don't know what scenario that would be, but it's interesting. It's a nice little thing that will help the weaker faction, I suppose. All right, and now we get to the Recipota mount, which explains why I didn't know what it was earlier. I was a little confused. But yeah, so now you can get the Recipotas as mounts. They're a unique grade mount with a lot of health, but you can't equip armor on them because, well, they're already quite armored. It has a base movement speed of 9, and it's only a one seat mount. If you have a special license, I don't know where you get this license, you can use it during the siege, and of course there can only be one at a time during a siege. Uh, it even protects you from outside attacks. So if you're attacked while you're on this mount, it'll only affect the Recipota's health. The Recipota can't carry trade packs though, so very sad. And the mount is created by combining 10 Recipota parts from machine part boxes, which have a chance to drop from the Recipotas when they're defeated. The mount only lasts 7 days though, so it is temporary. Let's take a look at the skills that it has. So, it has Boulder Rain when used. The Recipota deals massive damage on vehicles, ships, and castle walls, but it consumes 30% of the Recipota's health in order to be used. Can only be used on targets between 30 meters and 40 meters away, which is interesting. You have guided missiles, which fires multiple rounds of guided missiles and deals significant siege damage. Goes into a stationary mode and doesn't move while using this skill. Has a maximum of three charges, grants one charge per hour. Not usable on summons on monsters, consumes 20% of health. I'm seeing a theme. They all seem to use health. There's then Earthquake, which slams itself into the ground, interrupting enemies. It doesn't give us a range on that but that consumes 15% of the health. Then we have Summon Mines, which drops four mines in a 15 meter radius. Mines either explode when contacted by enemies or after 10 seconds. And then four types of mines are randomly chosen, and they could also be identical. That consumes 20%. Then we have Shoot Acid, which shoots out acidic fluid, dealing siege damage. The fluid also weakens enemies' armors and causes them to receive 25% more damage. Ships take less damage, has a maximum of 5 charges, 1 charge per hour, and it consumes 5% of the Recipota's health. Which, this sounds really cool. It is only a 7 day mount, which makes sense because it does sound very strong. But I'm intrigued to see this one in action. Alright, next we have the new Ancestral skills. So, there are 8 new Ancestral skills. Readout Stone. So after taking a certain amount of damage, the effect increases defense, increases movement speed, grants me to stun, impale, trip, snare, slow, sh shackle, and dive trap. Stacks metal per damage received, and the effect provides additional benefits if the caster is equipped with a shield. I mean, some of this is already standard, but I'm not exactly sure what they've changed because I've not played around with it. Read out in a while. Uh, revitalizing cheer, stone is now a thing, so after taking a certain amount of damage, the effect increases max health and received healing. Oromancy actually has one where we have conversion stone, shield stone. After taking a certain amount of damage, the effect increases magic defense and then converts a percentage of received damage, magic damage to health. So I believe the difference there is the effect increases magic defense. Then we have Protective Wing Stone. After taking a certain amount of damage, the effect grants me as you two magic damage and silence. Alright. Then we have Occultism Changes. We've got the Cursed Fawns Stone. After taking a certain amount of damage, the effect in inflicts the Cursed Fawns debuff to the first attacker within 12 meters immediately. If the caster is under the effect of Poison, Bleeding, or Stalker's Mark, it removes mentioned debuffs from the caster and inflicts Sharp Fawns on the first attacker within 12 meters. Deals magic damage on the victim of cast phones or sharp phones. I believe that's standard. Um, summon Crow's Stone. After taking the certain amount of damage, the effect inflicts the Crow's attack 
To the first attacker within 12 meters immediately. If the caster is under the effect of poison, bleeding, or stalker's mark, removes mentioned debuffs from the caster and inflicts crow. Attack and stuns the first attacker within 12 meters. Interesting, okay. And then for witchcraft, we have Insidious Whisper. After taking a certain amount of damage, the effect inflicts the fear debuff to the first attacker within 12 meters. So all of these seem to revolve around after taking a certain amount of damage, it does X, which is interesting. Then we have Bubble Trap Stone. After taking a certain amount of damage, the effect inflicts the Bubble Trap debuff to the first attacker within 12 meters. So yeah, that's interesting. I don't know how exactly these work. But yeah, well, uh, very cool. There's more ancestral skills in there now. All right, and now we come to a really big part. There's a ton more housing being added over to Aurora now. So over in Sun Gold, over in Zelok, over in Wellsong, and I think Aegis as well. There's now four new housing zones that you can go to and set up. There's also a bunch of community quests there now as well. So there's community boards set up in all of these locations. There's one in Golden Runes as well. But you could already get housing there. So these community center quests work very much like the standard ones. Though you'll have to give in random stuff like ancestral crates or prince's coin purses or queen's coin purses in exchange. And you will get a bond which can be used to craft haram gear actually which is very interesting. It can also be turned in for garden infusions, which is cool to see. It's nice to see players that don't have the garden expansion being able to get those. Although, you know, I'd still like you to be able to craft up the previous infusions. I still think that needs to be a thing, but this is in there now. Along with the new housing areas being added, there's also a new trade outlet over in Heedmar to trade in Aurora and Specials and Aurora and Cargo. There's also a lot more quests as well if you're a resident in one of these areas. So there are tutorial quests available for residents which introduce the activities and basics of Aurora community centers. There's also community manager quests which are only available to residents. These consist of killing 50 mobs and reset daily. You'll get one Aurorian blue salt bond for that 100 honor points, XP and gold for each of those completed quests. And then the board quests are just for everyone so again they're just like your standard board quests but you know with princes coin passes and stuff now the top residents in certain zones also will get given a bunch of stuff as well so here you can see the grid but it's a lot of like tempering charm crates you'll get a bunch of honor a bunch of aurorian blue salt bonds which again can be turned in for haram gear or if you want to you know donate more to your to your area or something you can do here it also mentions that as an Auroran resident, you can help clean up the monsters that are left over. So apparently this monster corpse is left over that you can clean up. And these will give a give you a buff of either PV skeleton damage plus 5% or received PV damage minus 5%, which is cool as well. There's also Auroria specialties, which are specialties you can now trade in Auroria. And the coastal ones for these... There's just a massive list. If you would really want to look at these, you can press Shift O. But yeah, there's just Guild of Specialties, Aged, Honey, and Cheese and stuff for all the different zones now. So yeah, if you want to run Pax and Auroria, then our thing as well. And they're probably going to get net you a lot more gold than the normal runs. On top of this, we also have all these changes to the specialty pack payments. So you can just look through these. This is what it now is. On top of that. Alright, next we have an update to the farmhands as well. So, farmhands can now also use aqua farms. So, it'll need to be at least level 60 and have level 2 farming. But then you can throw it on an aqua farm and have, have it, you know, go at it. Alright, and now we get to some equipment tutorial quests and achievements changes. Which, uh, they don't sound too interesting at first. But there is one thing in here that's kind of cool to see. So, first of all, you know, we've got some adjustments were made to equipment tutorial quests, such as replacing a Lunar Gem, gives you a free bound for Lunar Gem crates, uh, whatever that is, gives you an unbound Lunar Frost crate. I don't know if anyone can translate that, but there you go. 
replacing the Simpsons effect gives you a serendipity stone pouch. Temper equipment gives you a bound tempering charm box. Craft and awakening scroll gives you a, a slash, apparently. I don't think it gives you anything from I'm gonna assume that's what that means. I don't know. And then some already existing quests have some new re item rewards. So some size and a brilliant explorer's equipment gives you a temper crate. Some size of radiant explorer's equipment gives you a flawless lunar frost crate. And picking fire glow lunar gems gives you a gem carver pouch. Then new achievements were also added, such as equipment awakening, which gives you a moon, moon sand fox crate. Socketing lunar gems, which gives you a lunar gem crate or a lunar charm crate. And then equipment improvements, which give you a crystal wings crate, which is cool. Now, here's a big thing. The recipe for Equipment Awakening Scroll Rank 3 is now available. So you can actually make Equipment Awakening Scroll Rank 3, which, which is big. So this means, you know, if you're a newer player, you maybe mess up, take, or you just want to, you know, make a new set and take it up to our RAM. You can now do that for very cheap, and you can stack them with gems. So... That's a really interesting change to see, and it's something I may end up playing around with. But yeah, this only costs one blank regrade scroll, two sun sunlight archium dust, and two moonlight archium dust. And it's crafted a proven warrior workbench for level fifty plus characters, which is quite cheap. So that's not much. That's not much at all. So yeah, there we go. All right, and now we have the new costume slot, which is an image item costume slot. So you can only put image item costumes in this slot which means once you've turned your costume into an image item you can throw it there and then you can just have your combat costume as a separate item on the normal co costume slot which is really interesting so if you currently have a costume that you've not image item just yet that will go in the normal costume slot and you'll need to turn it into an image item before you can actually wear it but it means you no longer fuse the combat costume and your standard costume together. It actually has a, just an entirely new slot, which is kind of cool. I actually like this change. All right, and now we get to the miscellaneous changes. So here there's a new skill bar, which you can add in. You can now have more skill savers. So if you want to switch between several different skill sets, that's available. Um, during sieges... If you have a vehicle already spawned before a siege starts, they will just be destroyed when the siege starts. So that's something to look out for. And they've also added the Royal Blood Raven robes, Griffin Guard uniform, and Shock Conqueror's plate to the Territory Crafting Workbench. So you can now craft those as costumes, which is cool. I think I really just like the um, Griffin Guard uniform. That was... They were the costumes that used to be on Mirage Isle that used to be able to just... I think you used to get them for Gilder Stars, and then you can craft... So it's cool that they're back in and you can actually get them. Also, they've changed some of the things with the farm hand. You don't get as many Vigor Points daily, but the free weekly Vigor Points has been increased to a thousand, so there's a few changes there. Um, there's nothing else that's massively important. They have completely changed Mirage Isle, I should say. So apparently they've made it so items have easier access and they've improved terrain on Mirage Isle but it, it looks different they've changed it I, the area when you first come in is a little barren so I don't know if I like that another big thing actually is the house owners are now always protected from pvp attacks near the housing area regardless of the zone's war cycle which is big for these new housing zones that have come in so if you have a house over in Aurora now you can't you can't be attacked while you're around it, which is very cool. It's like you have your own little peace zone. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the range on this is. I don't know if you've got to be standing in your housing zone or if you've just got to be near it. It doesn't exactly say. There's also a loosened serendipity stone which has been added that drops from mobs in the garden. I don't know what the loosened version of the serendipity stone does. Maybe it gives you a better chance at a getting the skill you want, getting the uh, stat you want. I don't really know. I don't know what that's going to be about. I'd like to see that. They've also removed the steed from the arena shop, which is interesting. I didn't think we'd be seeing stuff taken out. But yeah, um, that's really all there is. There's not, there's like some minor changes as well. 
but that, that's about it. There's a bunch of bug fixes, and then the known issues are the Mythic Great Bosses currently give zero points instead of 20. The new on Dragon looks like a Chronicle Quest, but it's unavailable content, which you can't do. The Eternal Oath, the Rani can open the 9 on 1, but the Rani can't, cannot complete. But Guild of Stars will be reduced. Okay, so yeah, don't open the opposite faction Chronicle Quest. Is all I'm saying. And then there's some localization issues as well, like the GT's name being displayed in Korean. But yeah, that is it. That is it for the patch notes. That is everything, I think. So thanks for watching. I'll go more in depth on some of these in later videos. So I'll probably do one on Still Water. Maybe the housing area if you guys really want to see more on that and on some of the new Aurorian bond features. I might throw some of that in as well. But yeah, thanks for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all the usual. And check me out on Twitch. I stream Arcage every Friday, Saturday. Oh, and join the Discord, because we always talk and have discussions in there. Anyway, I'm going to get back to farming mobs for the Christmas event. So I will see you all in the next video.